I'll get started. Uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is December 21st, 2022. It's 102 p.m. and I call this meeting to order. Um, first things first, I need to update the agenda. Um, we are going to do an executive session. The staff has recommended um, a social equity denial. Um, and uh, we want to hear the reasoning for that in executive session, as well as there, um, I think is there's a uh, applicant who has a disqualifying offense that's seeking a license that we're going to talk about as well. So um, <clears throat> we'll do that uh, right after the staff reviews all recommendations and right before the board votes on them. So um, this is our last board meeting of 2022. Um, I would have loved to give a poignant, um, you know, year-end recap of all of the great accomplishments. Um, uh, unfortunately, I just woke up <clears throat> from a three-day long, like, fever dream. So the fact that I'm here um, and not covered in vomit is probably going to have to be enough for today. Um, I will say that this has been a true honor and a privilege to serve Vermont in this capacity and to be supported by hands down the most dynamic team in all of state government. A huge thank you to everyone, um, all of our licensees and all the members of the public and the advocates and the experts who slogged it out with us through the drudgery of rulemaking and the ups and downs of the legislative process, um, a complicated licensing process uh, and every other little bump along the road. Uh, we did get some exciting news from the tax department about the cannabis tax revenue from October. <laughs> it looks like the state reported around 2.6 million in total sales um, for the month of October, which equated to 329,000 in excise tax collected. It's an impressive figure for a number of reasons. Um, you know, we only had a handful of retail locations that were open. The availability of products was limited. Um, you know, also late fall, early winter is actually a very much a low point for tourism in the state. So while this is only one month worth of data, um, you know, I think it's very notable that uh, 329,000 is squarely within the range that our economic model predicted for the kind of early market. And that's important, um, at least to me, or significant because, um, you know, our model diverges <clears throat> pretty significantly from the Joint Fiscal Office's projections. You know, our market projections are larger. Um, so, you know, this early report seems to indicate, and it's early again, um, that some of the assumptions that we made with respect to the kind of size of this market might actually be holding true and that we should stay the course um, with what we're doing. A few administrative points. Um, we have a report due to the legislature on how we intend to regulate hemp derived products. We will be reviewing this report later in this meeting. Um, I know there's questions from hemp producers in the state about how things might change for them in the new year. I'd make a couple of high level points. Um, one, if you are growing hemp, but you're not making hemp derived products, your jurisdiction and your license are with the USDA. Two, if you're making non-intoxicating hemp-derived products, you need to register with the CCB through an online form that will be available on our website by the end of the year. Three, if you're making intoxicating hemp-derived products, you need to apply for an adult-use cannabis product manufacturing license. I know there's a lot to unpack in those definitions um, and our report begins to unpack those, um, but some of the finer points still need to be worked through. Just like we did with our adult use and medical use programs, we intend to listen to and be responsive to the needs of our hemp growers while balancing our general public health and safety mandates. Um, another administrative point, we have to adopt our regular meeting schedule for the new year. Um, we're going to be moving to one board meeting per month. Generally speaking, um, unless there's a holiday, um, it will be on the last Monday of each month. 
In between board meetings, we're going to focus on more interactive Q&A public engagement events on topics that we feel need some additional atten attention. Um, as a reminder, we are doing one of these live Q&A events next Tuesday, December 27th from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, on the topic of product registration, which can include questions about uh, hemp registration. Um, the link to join that is up on our uh, website um, in the calendar there. Also, we have a new testing flow chart um, guide that uh, I think is up on our website. If not, it will be soon. Um, and that should be helpful in navigating some of the kind of workflow questions around testing compliance. Other than that, just need to approve the minutes from our last meeting on December 14th. You guys Hello? had a chance to look at those? Oh, yep. Yep. Is there a motion? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. All right. Um, so, Bryn, would you mind pulling up uh, on the screen just our, um, if you have it available, if not, I can do it, um, our uh, regular meeting schedule, proposed regular meeting schedule for 2023? I do not have that. Sorry. Sorry about that. Maybe I, I can pull that. I think the three of you have it, and maybe I don't. <laughs> One second. That will be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> you can get it fast enough. Okay. Do you want it? Yeah, I got it. So um, this is a half year. This essentially gets us through the legislative session, um, at which point we can kind of reevaluate whether this once a month is working or whether it needs to be more or less frequent. But I think this is a good approach for at least the first half of uh, next year. Is there a um, motion to approve the regular meeting schedule? So moved. Seconded. Any discussion? No, I think except for the folks wondering at home why Monday, um, the legislature meets Tuesday to Friday. So, so we can all be here if there's other obligations. Yep. Great. All right. All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay. Bryn, are you prepared to walk through this another major report? Yes, I am. All right. Great. Make sure I can share my screen. There we go. It worked today. Good. <clears throat> so um, this report uh, is, I'd just like to emphasize that this is a draft report to the legislature um, on, as the chair mentioned, how the Vermont Cannabis Control Board is recommending that we regulate um, the hemp industry. So um, this is subject to change. This report is due on January 15th. Um, and so it may change before we submit it to the legislature. Um, starting with the overview, um, we've got, we start out with the legislative uh, requirements for the report. Um, we go into some findings and recommendations. Um, the report gives a national overview of um, where other states are in regulating this process. And then a proposed regulatory structure some fee and budget recommendations, and then at the end, some other recommendations. So this is um, the legislative language that required the report found in Act 158. <clears throat> the report is due to, I think, four standing committees, and it um, covers recommendations on what hemp products the CCB would regulate, how those products would be regulated, registration fees um, associated with the regulation, and then any resources that are required um, by the board to regulate um, the industry. So we've got um, some other legislative language that also sets out the board's authority over hemp products, 
Um, and so that <clears throat> this slide and the next slide. I won't go through all of this language, but um, I will point out that um, the legislation does give the board the authority to adopt rules um, to administer its hemp program. Um, and also gives explicitly gives the board the authority to regulate synthetic cannabinoids and hemp derived cannabinoids, including delta eight and delta ten THC. So I'll move on to some key findings and recommendations. <clears throat> and these the this set of slides is really intended to um, provide some background information, some education to the legislators um, for who this from this subject matter area might be new. Um, so we start out with the farm bill, um, a little back uh, background about the 2018 farm bill that exempted hemp um, from the Controlled Substances Act. Um, and when it did that, it also expressly preserved the FDA's authority to regulate hemp and um, hemp products. So, um, so far, only a few hemp derived ingredients um, have been approved for the safe use in food or dietary supplements. Um, and none of the intoxicating or synthetic cannabinoids that are commonly found in hemp products um, have been approved for retail sale. So really despite um, the FDA's authority to regulate these products, um, there's only been a handful of enforcement actions and only when uh, the manufacturers or the businesses were really making pretty egregious claims about their products. So that leads to um, that lack of enforcement really leads to some consumer confusion because it means that these products um, are appearing on the shelves next to um, more natural cannabinoid products um, like CBD products. And um, that can lead to some confusion between what is what and, um, and there is a real lack of education over the different types of effects that these products would have. Um, versus the more natural CBD products that are found on the market. So this slide provides um, an outline of the recommendation for um, products that the CCB is proposing be limited to um, the regulated cannabis market. So given that there's a real lack of federal government um, enforcement, uh, the CCB is proposing that all intoxicating hemp products, um, which are defined, and this is um, the same, this is these are the same parameters that were set out in the bulletin um, that the CCB issued on the hemp to, towards the hemp industry in November. So intoxicating hemp products, which would be defined as consumable hemp products with a milligram or more of THC per serving, or more than 10 milligrams THC per package. Um, would be required to be sold through the adult use and medical markets and would be subject to the same um, regulations that um, high THC cannabis products would be subject to, including product registration. So a caveat to this is that full spectrum tinctures, capsules, and salves um, with up to one and a half milligrams of THC per serving uh, and a ratio of THC to CBD of one to 20 or greater would be considered non-intoxicating and therefore would not be limited um, to retail sale only in the adult use and medical use cannabis market. Um, so these products that we are calling intoxicating consumable hemp products um, would only be allowed to be sold through licensed retail establishments and dispensaries. And um, as I mentioned earlier, subject to the same regulations um, as high THC cannabis products. And all manufacturers of these types of products um, would be required to be licensed manufacturers under um, the adult use or medical program pursuant to board rule one. So we'll get into this um, in a little bit more detail later on, but that's an overview. Um, and for general retail products, so that former slide was products that would be limited to the adult use or medical market, um, consumable hemp products, that would not be limited to that market because of um, they didn't meet that threshold level of a milligram of THC per serving, um, could continue to be sold through general retail stores or online. And the board would re begin requiring that all hemp processors and product manufacturers who are making these types of products um, 
would be registered with the board by January 1st of 2023. So registered as hemp processors, which will be a separate process from registering as a product manufacturer under the adult use system. So the board is going to ensure that these um, hemp processor businesses that we register comply with all the relevant regulations. Um, but we are proposing that additional enforcement may need to be taken by other government agencies and law enforcement to ensure that general retail locations um, only have approved hemp derived products like CBD products on the shelves and aren't offering any intoxicating products um, as defined in the earlier slide. And um, hemp cultivators, as the chair mentioned in the opening remarks, hemp cultivators will be regulated by the USDA and not by the board. So moving on now to the national overview. So again, these are some educational slides. Um, this first one is about the federal status of hemp um, pursuant to the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, the, the Farm Bill is um, the bill that essentially removed hemp products from uh, the Controlled Substances Act um, and categorized hemp as an agricultural commodity uh, under the purview of, of the USDA. Um, and the USDA published a rule effective um, in March of 21 that provided that regulations for hemp production and removed hemp derived products from Schedule One status under the Controlled Substances Act. So essentially what this means is that hemp was removed um, from the Controlled Substances Act, but it wasn't, it did not legalize all products that contained hemp derived ingredients. And as we mentioned earlier, the Farm Bill expressly preserved the FDA's authority to regulate these products, um, which is something that the FDA is um, doing only very minimally. As this slide describes, um, so the FDA's oversight, <clears throat> Um, has been fairly minimal. Removing a substance from the Controlled Substances Act doesn't make it doesn't make that substance eligible um, to be put into food or um, dietary supplements or anything else that you can consume. Um, so any consumable product still needs to follow federal product safety rules before it can be legally sold. Um, and those traditional standards for food safety would require that a hemp derived ingredient be generally recognized as safe or approved as a new dietary ingredient. Um, and so only, only a couple of hemp derived ingredients have been determined to meet these criteria and that's hemp seed oil and hold hemp seed oil. So this last paragraph here describes CBD as exhibiting some of the characteristics of products that would be determined to be generally recognized as safe but the intoxicating cannabinoids um, or synthetically derived cannabinoids would not be, have not been approved and really don't fit the profile of the types of products that would be approved. So um, given all of that, um, the popularity of these products has um, just steadily increased since the Farm Bill passed. Um, so these are the types of products that have really uh, proliferated in the consumable hemp market. Um, we've got the Delta 9 gummies. Um, here's a, just a sign showing that Delta 8 is being sold at a gas station. Um, so some of these products are really focused on CBD or other naturally derived cannabinoids. Um, and those products are likely safe and provide some health benefits. Um, but these are examples of products that are really focused on intoxicating or synthetically produced cannabinoids um, that are also um, really readily available either online or in stores around the state. So another educational slide um, just describing how THC and CBD are kind of the most well-known uh, cannabinoids within the cannabis plant, but there are um, well over a hundred other cannabinoids that are contained in small amounts. And we really know very little about those cannabinoids. Um, and natural cannabinoids like Delta-9 and CBD have been consumed um, by people throughout history. But those novel cannabinoids, the ones that are um, naturally occurring in small amounts in the cannabis plant um, can be extracted from the plant now and isolated or manufactured by converting CBD into other 
um, minor cannabinoids. And some good examples of that are Delta-8 and Delta-10 THC products. Um, and these are the types of products that are infused in food and dietary supplements. Um, and they, because they have not been consumed um, by humans before in history, we really don't know the health impacts that they could have. So because there's a proliferation of these types of hemp products, um, there is a concern that there is a growing health and safety issue um, that people have access to these products and are using them. So uh, this slide puts forth that the most pressing problems are that these intoxicating cannabis products are available outside the regulated cannabis market, um, where they are not subject to any of the regulatory standards that the board imposes. So they could be sold to um, kids, um, and they are not subject to the testing requirements, et cetera. Many of these products are created by using unsafe manufacturing processes um, that can leave residual solvents behind in the finished product. And um, these types of products that are either dangerous and or intoxicating are found on the shelves right next to other more natural products like CBD, and that can cause confusion. So, as mentioned earlier, many of these uh, hemp processing businesses are really taking advantage of um, the fact that hemp is has been removed from the Controlled Substances Act, um, but is not being very heavily regulated by the FDA. So, a number of these products are available. Um, they're being shipped all over the country, um, and the FDA has really taken a limited approach to enforcing the regulations. Um, that would keep them off the shelves. So um, this slide sets out some additional concerns with those novel cannabinoids. Um, so there's, this is kind of a reiteration of what we talked about in the earlier slides. There's been significant public health concerns um, that have, that are due to these consumable products um, being available on the shelves. And because of the FDA's limited um, engagement and enforcing, the board is really in a position where um, we need to take uh, some action. So while we really have a better understanding of those cannabinoids that are more well known, we really have almost no data on the safety of manufacturing or concentrating these novel cannabinoids. So this slide demonstrates the size of this intoxicating hemp market. Um, so data from Colorado shows that Delta-8 is already a $500 million industry and expected to grow um, significantly next year. And um, because there's been kind of recent increases in the availability of these products and also increased reported incidents involving um, people who've used these products, both the FDA and the CDC have released um, health advisory bulletins that address the issue. Um, but Vermont really needs to ensure that we are regulating these products to prevent um, Vermonters from turning to these unregulated and potentially unsafe products. So um, this is a map um, showing how other states are addressing the issue of these um, intoxicating hemp products. So you can see here um, that in Oregon, kind of the Oregon, California, Nevada um, are allowing these products to be sold um, only at dispensaries. We've got kind of a whole, um, it runs the gamut how states are dealing with this. You can see just by this, uh, by this chart that there's not, um, there's not one singular approach to how to deal with these products. Okay, so we're gonna move next to the regula regulatory structure slides, um, starting with the goals um, that would be achieved by the recommendation for how we would regulate these products. So the first would be to remove any unsafe products from the market. Um, the second would be to limit any intoxicating products to the adult use or medical cannabis market. Um, another goal is to promote Vermont's local hemp businesses. And to give Vermont consumers access to safe regulated products. 
So um, this slide talks about our approach to regulating uh, those products that the CCB believes should be limited to the uh, adult use cannabis market. So it's um, the real recommendation of this report is that these intoxicating products uh, that contain synthetic cannabinoids um, should only be available in the ad existing adult use and medical market and not outside of it for the reasons that we've talked about earlier in the report. So um, all those products would all be required to meet the health and safety regulations um, that the board has imposed through rule, um, which we list some of them here. So moving on to how the board would be defining intoxicating. Um, so this is kind of a reiteration of what we described in the beginning of the report. Um, the board is initially going to deem a product intoxicating if it contains more one milligram or more of total THC per serving or more than 10 milligrams per package. Again, that would be subject to the exception um, for products that are uh, full spectrum, tinctures, capture, capsules, or salves. Um, and those could go up to one and a half milligrams of THC per serving as long as they are full spectrum and maintain that ratio of um, THC to CBD that's one to 20 or more. So those are the products that would initially be considered to be non-intoxicating and would be um, allowed to be sold in the regular market. And um, this calculation may need to be adjusted um, as time goes on, as more research um, is developed and as, um, as we hear public input as well. So any product that would be deemed intoxicating would only be eligible um, for production and sale through the adult use or medical market. So if you were a manufacturer who wanted to manufacture these types of products, you would need to get a manufacturing license um, from the board. Or if you wanted to sell these products, you would need a retail license. So this slide provides some information about the definition of synthetic. Um, so the plan is to define synthetic cannabinoid as a cannabinoid-like compound that was produced using chemical synthesis, chemical modification, or chemical conversion, including in vitro biosynthesis and bioconversion of any method or type except for those produced through the decarboxylation of the naturally occurring cannabinoids from their acidic form. So any product with a milligram or more that says more than one milligram, it should say one milligram or more of a synthetic cannabinoid per serving would only be eligible for production um, through the adult use market, where it would need to meet all of those manufacturing requirements and be approved by the board through product registration before it was available to consumers. So these products, um, that are hemp-derived and um, deemed intoxicating would um, need to comply with all of the existing public health and safety regulations. They'd be subject to testing requirements and the age-gated sales, all of the labeling and packaging requirements, um, the limits on total THC per package. And then once they made it through the product registration process, they would um, be eligible to be sold to consumers. So the plan also is to initially prohibit um, synthetic cannabinoid products that contain Delta-8, Delta-10, or other novel cannabinoids for which there is insufficient data to demonstrate that um, that cannabinoid, that synthetic cannabinoid would be safe for humans to consume. Um, product registration, this just sets out that just like everything else, these um, hemp products that the board is deeming would intoxicating would have to be submitted through the product registration process so that we could ensure that it meets all of the requirements of the rule um, and then be eligible for sale on the adult use market. And they wouldn't be available anywhere else. So this slide covers the approach to products that would be allowed in the general retail market. So those hemp-derived products that are um, not considered intoxicating um, and that don't contain more than a milligram of synthetically derived cannabinoid uh, would be available for purchase on the regular retail market um, and online. 
And as I mentioned earlier, the board will begin registering hemp processors who would intend to make these types of products um, in January of 23. So, as I mentioned earlier, hemp cultivation is going to remain um, under USDA's regulatory authority. Um, and we, it's the board's position that that, um, that the USDA would be, um, the USDA's uh, oversight of the hemp cultivation industry would be sufficient and actually allows more focused resources on consumable hemp. Um, and it also decreases the burden um, on Vermont and allows Vermont to focus on areas where we have regulatory discretion. So this slide details um, how enforcement will work. So products that are, as I've mentioned, these intoxicating products that would um, be required to be sold through the adult use or medical market, um, Cannabis Control Board compliance team would enforce those rules. Um, for non-intoxicating hemp products that are manufactured for the general retail market, um, the board plans to require registration for these hemp processors, as I mentioned. Um, and we will not have a role in enforcing the rules against those products. Um, responsibility for enforcement is going to fall to law enforcement and other government agencies. And this last sentence is really directed to the legislature. Um, if the legislature decides that they would like the board to have an additional role in enforcing the rules against um, hemp-derived products that are non-intoxicating, um, then we would need um, to put forward a proposal for additional funding and staffing. And speaking of funding and, staff and uh, staffing, here's our proposed license and registration fees. So for hemp processors that would be required to be registered with the board, um, these are the folks that would be producing products that are non-intoxicating. Um, we're proposing a $25 application fee and a $1,000 annual registration fee. Um, and for hemp manufacturers that intend to produce products with a milligram or more of THC per serving, um, those folks would be subject to the existing fees that are set in statute for cannabis product manufacturers. So the proposal that's set out in the report um, would not require uh, additional staffing at this time. Um, we're proposing to be able to do this type of regulation without additional staff. Um, however, we are proposing uh, instituting a quality assurance program um, that would require an appropriation for um, funding for lab equipment and um, three additional staff to work at the state lab so that we could conduct a compliance and quality control and R&D testing at the state lab, which would really assist us in ensuring that the businesses that we are regulating are um, in compliance with the testing regulations. And it will also help the um, Vermont businesses really build their reputations. There's a request for staff and equipment and that's, and, but no building space. And so that's, there's assumption that there's already space for that, right? Right. There, there's, yeah. there is an existing state lab where we're proposing that our, um, Quality Assurance Program would be housed. Okay, nearly there. So this this uh, last several slides are about our um, other recommendations. Um, so this is an endorsement program for Maine Vermont products. Um, so this is a recommendation that the legislature direct uh, an expansion of the Vermont um, hemp product and hemp infused product program. So it would protect public health and safety, boost local economies, um, uh, and the state would promote this endorsement of Vermont hemp products and hemp infused products. So that could really have the effect of increasing visibility for local Vermont businesses, generating demand for um, products that are from Vermont and are in compliance with the rule. 
So the proposal here is to develop a simple registration process that would result in a state approved endorsement um, that retailers or product manufacturers could use on their products and would allow consumers to make a more educated decision when they're purchasing their products. Um, so this is um, more information about the endorsement program. So the Maple program is really the model um, here. So program staff could conduct periodic in inspections um, of these hemp producers and hemp products, similar to how the Maple program runs. Um, and the outcome would really be something similar where uh, Vermont products add an endorsement that could really help with marketing and give consumers um, a sense of security about what they're consuming. So here are some other programs and other states that are similar to the Vermont Maple program. So Buy Colorado is a program that promotes state companies um, and the state's repu rep rep reputation. Um, New York has a New York State Grown and Certified program that makes it easy for people to identify um, New York products. And Wisconsin has a something special from Wisconsin program administered by the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture. Um, so these are all examples of other states that have done something similar. Okay, so the next recommendation is to create a public awareness and educational campaign um, that would encourage consumers of these types of products to um, purchase products that have been vetted by the Cannabis Control Board. Um, so really this uh, campaign would about be, be about steering people towards the regulated market um, so that people could be assured that um, the products that they're using have um, met all of the regulatory requirements of the Cannabis Control Board's rules. So a proposal to develop outreach and educational programs that's really designed um, to inform consumers about the difference between um, these unregulated products, um, potentially intoxicating products, and then um, safer products like CBD. And um, should educate consumers on the dangers of consuming products that are not regulated. And then this is really um, a recommendation on enforcement to work with other agencies and really properly fund enforcement actions um, to ensure that non-compliant products are not available. So as we mentioned earlier, lots of hemp producers are, are making products that are potentially intoxicating, um, selling them online. And though the board really has limited control over what's um, sold online, we can control what's sold through our licensees, um, our licensed stores, um, but the board is not going to be in a position to enforce rules against um, convenience stores, unlicensed outlets that might be selling these unregulated products. So ensuring that, um, that proper law enforcement is in place to do that um, regulation is important. And then I think lastly, or almost lastly, um, this is a recommendation to clarify that the tax um, on e-cigarettes doesn't apply to cannabis products. So the idea here is that because cannabis and uh, tobacco are really significantly different products, um, the taxation on these products should reflect the different um, challenges that the state faces in regulating each one. So recommendation that the legislature clarify that cannabis products including um, vape cartridges, are not subject to the 92% tax rate on e-cigarettes. And this recommendation is being made because um, cannabis has um, a robust and untaxed illicit market that still exists. And those um, that significant tax is going to push consumers um, towards purchasing vape products, cannabis vape products, on the illicit market um, or out of state. And as we've noted in other reports, um, those unregulated uh, cannabis products that can be found in the illicit market are could potentially be harmful for human health. And then I think lastly, um, Vermont should really encourage federal partners to allow for additional research, particularly on these intoxicating and synthetically derived 
um, hemp products. A similar slide here to um, our push for additional research in the concentrates report. And there you have it. Thanks, Thank Brian. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Not, uh, it's not easy trying to draft two big reports like that simultaneously. Um, but thank you. That's great. I know that that's, uh, you know, I think that map that you showed ref roughly around slide 25, which just, you know, when it comes to THC, there's kind of a common framework that people at least start from. When it comes to hemp dried products, there's nothing. Uh, you know, every state is struggling intensely uh, with dealing with some of these intoxicating hemp drive isolates. Um, and no one has figured out the best approach. And, you know, this is our first crack at it. I think it's uh, common sense um, what we've proposed here. But, um, you know, we're very open to taking comment and um, kind of you know, having our approach evolve. Any questions for Bryn about the report? Nope. No, just, just, you know, piggybacking off of what you just said, Pepper, you know, this is a, we're endeavor, embarking on a, I would imagine nine month to 12 month process. This is, this public comment session today is not your only opportunity to give us your thoughts. We'll initiate rulemaking sometime in the new year, and, and we can take more substantive um, written comments at that time if if you feel like we've missed the mark here. So, Bryn, I know um, I, I saw Susanna sign into our executive session, um, but uh, what, what would you what would be your preference be? I, I mean, I, I could easily take a break um, for us to kind of regroup before we look at the staff recommendations or we could do our executive session now prior to the staff recommendations. Um, you know, I think that we are good to go to look at your register and then move into executive session after you've seen your register. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, if you're up for that, then let's, um, let's do it that way. Okay. I'm here. Okay, so here's your register for this week, starting with the medical program. Um, you can see that for over the last couple of weeks, the numbers of new um, patient applications has dropped somewhat and renewal applications also, but 21 patient cards were issued um, in the last week and one caregiver application was approved and one just dispensary employee ID card was issued. So moving on to our big wall of numbers here. Um, here's our adult use license applications as of yesterday. Um, so again, the majority of our new applications are for employee ID cards. Um, three new cannabis establishment applications in the last week, uh, two for an indoor cultivation license and one for I believe a tier two manufacturing license um, and no new retail application licenses, applications uh, this week. So we're continuing to see that um, slow down in new establishment applications. Here is your, um, this is the chart that details the location of retail licensees and applications. Um, this actually has one fewer in the total down here this week because we actually had one um, application that was in the process that was um, 
dismissed. So we've got one fewer now. So essentially no change to that list, apart from there being one less in the queue. So here is our list um, of recommendations for a cannabis establishment license this week. And as usual, these are the applications um, that have demonstrated compliance with all of the requirements for their license, both in board rule and in statute. So our list this week is Canna Cultivators Collective that has applied for a mixed tier one cultivation license. Vermont Herbal Essentials, who's applied for a tier two manufacturing license. Bear Mother Cannabis applied for a tier two manufacturing license. High Bricks Cannabis Vermont, indoor tier one cultivation license. Theory Wellness of Vermont has applied for a retail license. Mary Jane Mountain, also a retail license. Hidden Door Cannabis has applied for an indoor tier one cultivation license. 802 Pharmacy has applied for an indoor tier one cultivation license. And Green Union has applied for a retail license. So that is your list for this week. We've got nine up for approval this week. Um, here's an update on our license amendments. I think we have a few more in there. And then here's our social equity information. Um, I don't think we've seen any change here in social equity um, numbers in this last seven days. We do have one recommendation this week for a denial of social equity status, um, and that's for submission number 941. The applicant um, was determined by staff to not meet the criteria for a social equity business applicant as defined in board rule. And um, I am requesting that we go into executive session to discuss um, both this applicant's social equity status denial and another um, applicant who staff is recommending for approval of their license who does have a presumptively disqualifying offense. Great. Um, well, why don't we do that then? Um, I don't, you know, I've read the, the memos. I'm not sure it'll take all that long. Um, but you know, we are generally wrong about that in the past. Um, is there a motion to go into executive session? I move that the CCB go into executive session to consider confidential attorney client communications made for the purposes of providing professional legal services to the body and that the executive session is required because premature general public knowledge regarding such communications would clearly place the board at a substantial disadvantage. I further move to invite Susanna Davis, director um, of the racial and, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of the department, racial equity. <laughs> Office of Racial Equity for the State and Jay Green, also of that office. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, you know, why don't we say come back 205, 15 minutes? I think that should probably do it. Um, do you disagree, yep. Boone? No, I agree with that. Okay. Okay, Nelly, would you mind just putting up our away message um, and just indicate that we'll be back at 2.05? Can do. All right, thank you. Great, all right, then um, let's resume this meeting. Um, it's 1.59, um, just got out of executive session. Um, once again, uh, you know, the staff recommended um, a social equity status denial um, because, uh, well, for reasons that we discussed in executive session. And then, um, you know, there was also a prospective licensee who was up for approval today that had a disqualifying event in their history, in their criminal history. And um, we uh, discussed that and we decided that, well, I guess we'll vote on how we decided. We just discussed that event. So um, we've heard all of the staff recommendations. Um, is there a motion to approve the staff recommendations? I move that the board accept each of the recommendations as presented to us by staff in this meeting. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so I think last on our agenda for today, if I'm not wrong, is public comment. Um, we will um, do this the same way we always do. If you have a public comment, please, uh, and you join via the video link, please just raise your virtual hand 
we'll do our best to call on you in the order that you raised your hand. And uh, then we'll move to folks that join via the phone. Tito. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me OK? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. OK, so um, first, I just wanted to bring up uh, the vape tax again um, through all these recommendations. I'm just I'm not even hearing the vape tax come up at all. Um, this is a really serious problem. And, uh, you know, I know it, it sounds like everybody cares about the health of medical patients. And it's this this vape tax is just awful. Um, we got to do something about this. Do you know, it's in um, both of our reports. It, it is see it one of our recommendations in both of them. It's it's called the tobacco products tax, and it's it's recommended that we remove it for cannabis products in both reports. Oh, great. OK, thank you so much. I apologize for not seeing that. Um, yeah, and um, next, I, I also commend you on the synthetic cannabis um, uh, products and, and banning those. Um, those are some really bad products, and they also attract really bad players, too. Um, I've been in this, uh, you know, in the in the pipe industry for a really long time, and these are all the same people that that brought us spice back in the day. Um, you know, all those spice people just turned their 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 focus onto uh, all these synthetic cannabinoids, and they are definitely bad. Um, and then, lastly, um, I just I just beg you guys to meet before the end of January. Um, we were uh, here at Burn. We were so close. Uh, I, I was hoping to see an approval today, um, but it looks like the inspectors really want to see every single last detail finished, even finished paint. Um, you know, uh, we, we, you know, we don't have the finishing touches, which we're putting on right now, but now, um, you know, we'll have to wait, uh, you know, five weeks essentially before we can, uh, be moved through the process. So if there is any way you can meet before that, that, that would be amazing. Um, thank you guys all so much for your hard work. Tito, is that, can I just ask you quickly, is that our inspectors or is that the kind of local fire safety folks? No, that's your inspectors. Okay. So basically, uh, we're comp we're we're completely ready. Um, the only thing we don't have done is the finishing paint job and the actual stone countertop, which we're putting onto our our counter wall. Um, but that's it. Everything else is done. You know, we we have our our safe, we have our duchy installed and ready to go. Um, and um, we we did have some issues with the front window, but it looks like we did we're able to um, to all agree um, that that products will not be visible from the street. Um, and uh, and the counter wall, which had to be completed, which I understood, but you know that wall was is definitely completely done. Um, but the inspector that came last really wanted to see every uh, all, all details completely finished, as if we are ready to do business. And uh, we acknowledge that we're not going to uh, be able to start selling cannabis right away, uh, but but just to be approved to just keep moving through the process so that we could uh, you know just keep things moving. And of course, there's a lot of stuff we have to do before we can actually open. We have a couple of weeks of buying. And, um, and and stuff like that. So you know, we're just so so eager to move through this process. Um, I quit blowing glass seven years ago to move on this journey, and uh, and the finish line is just. I'm like the donkey with the carrot. It's just always right in front of me. The finish line is right there, but the, it just keeps moving and moving and moving endlessly. Um, uh, and, and I just would love to see that goalpost stop, so we can just move through the next phase. Thanks, thanks, Tito. Thank you, guys. Keith. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi. So one quick one is just when can we get these slides that you showed today on the hemp? I don't see them on They'll the website. Later today. Later today. Posted okay. to the website and, later today. Okay. And then could I ask what what is the point of having the hemp groups register by January 1st? I mean, this these rules won't be in place. So why do that with nine days notice and <laughs> try to create all that anxiety around the hemp companies getting registered in the state? It will be available by January 1st. There are a number of hemp processors that are registered with the Agency of Agriculture and that's when their jurisdiction expires. So you don't have to um, apply by January 1st. That's when it will be available. Okay, thank you, that's it. Thanks, Keith. And I would just remind folks that, you know, we are having a Q&A session uh, next Tuesday, 6 to 7 p.m. Um, you know, this this public comment period isn't necessarily a place where we can answer questions directly. It's not the purpose of a public comment session. Um, so uh, just a reminder on that.
Jason. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks. Uh, appreciate it. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, first off, um, gratitude towards uh, your work, uh, Brandon team, um, focusing on the you know important things as we process the that and navigate through this regulatory system um, as we adjust things. I appreciate that and keeping us informed. These meetings have been very helpful for um, not only myself but other licensees and people coming into the market. Um, this is not a criticism, just just uh, possibly a recommendation um, as you build uh, sp specifically for the hemp, but also with um, cannabis related in the whole, uh, possibly um, adjusting the language to be a bit more accurately describing the medicinal effects of cannabis slash hemp um, derived products to use uh, psychoactive versus uh, intoxicating um, due to the nature of, we're talking about small percentages from topicals, which generally are not intoxicating nor psychoactive, whatever term we use. Um, just maybe that's just a recommendation on the building of, of this, um, uh, this regulatory uh, adjustment uh, to present to the, to, to the, to the legislative process. Um, and that's all I have to say for now, and I appreciate your time. And I think we will all miss the weeklies. Um, I hope that it brings a little peace of mind that we're getting um, a few more steps uh, forward. And, um, you know, I look forward to the monthlies uh, because I think it's been very helpful for a lot of people just to understand language, have uh, you know, face to face to face, if you may. Um, uh, and I appreciate it, guys. And uh, James, hope you feel better. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jason. Robert. Hi, just a real quick question. Uh, what is the status of the map that has all the locations that is not currently up on the uh, licensed page? Hey, thanks for the question. Um, again, we don't generally answer questions here, but I think if there is a map that was once up that's not up now, um, I don't know what the status is. OK, thanks. Yarim. Well, hello, you guys and ladies. Uh, once again, thank you very much for listening to what we have to say. Uh, Yarim Plantillas, Rick Clover Analytics. Um, one comment I have with the monthly uh, meetings that you guys having, does that, that, uh, that means that you're only going to be uh, voting on licenses once a month, uh, that, uh, if I'm correct. Um, with that said, uh, that puts a lot of 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 uh, weight on us um, because if say we 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 are ready to go live one day after you already had met, that means that we have to wait an entire month for you guys to meet again for us to be able to obtain that one license. For us, that is. We're talking about uh, just my payroll is going to be between thirty-five and sixty-five thousand dollars a month to be able to maintain that. So that means that I have to invest uh, another sixty-five thousand dollars onto the business. That's, that's just in payroll, just to wait thirty days for you guys to meet again and and give a judgment on my license. Uh, so if you guys could meet, you know, especially in special circumstances for licenses. That will be great. It will help us all, you know, get to, uh, you know, that stage. Um, but thank you guys for listening in. Yeah, thanks for the comment, Yareem. Bobby. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, I wanted to echo some of these concerns that Tito and Yareem just mentioned. Um, you know, I know a number of hopeful licensees that are just at that finish line. A number of them have been, you know, dealing with some moving goalposts. Uh, you know, ourselves, we're waiting on just the installation of two cameras, I believe, that are literally being put up tomorrow. 
So uh, a five week lead time to, for approval is it's really rough, especially with the uh, you know, delays we're going to see with packaging approval and product registration and not being able to really accurately start those processes immediately. Uh, you know, that's going to have us not having product on shelf until March, April at the earliest. And that's just it's quite the fiscal burden on us. Um, so I'd like to encourage you to re reconsider that or at least make some sort of uh, workaround. I acknowledge that y'all are super understaffed and overworked, but uh, I think there's some equilibrium to be had here. Uh, thank you. Feel better, Pepper. If you want to shoot me your address, I'll get you some Jewish penicillin. I'm always ready. Thank, thanks for the comment. Marie. Um, oh, sorry. No, no. Marie, yep. You know, it's ironic. I was just gonna gonna say, I think a blueberry strain would do you well right now. So look into it. Um, but I also have to, to comment and say, I love, love, love the jumper, or would it be the ugly Christmas sweater, the lady in the back head, the red, with all the little balls hanging off. <laughs> so, uh, and lastly, I thank you for everything you did this year. It's been a long, long hell of a ride for all of us. You've done great. Don't listen to any haters. You guys are awesome. And I appreciate what you've done, especially coming from uh, my old stomping grounds in New York. I see what they're doing and it looks it looks like a headache and a half that I wouldn't want to touch. I love what Vermont's doing. You guys are doing a great job. Happy holidays, guys. Thanks, Marie. Dave. Hey, all, uh, James, you, you sound terrible and you should really not be here today. Um, the real comment, though, is, I mean, like, you should rest and, and you know, take care of yourself. Um, but the real comment is um, echoing on on, on Tito. Um, you, you know, the monthly meetings do, does cause some pause. Uh, you, you know, I've got a client who's been in resubmit for about a week. This morning we got um, a, a notice from staff saying a couple of things were missing, but those things actually were in the application already, and they're there. Uh, but there weren't they weren't on but the client didn't make it onto the list today even though they really ought to have and now the client is going to wait a month and that's very frustrating um you know it's actually it's going to end up waiting six weeks um and, and so that's very frustrating uh and and i and i hope that you guys can figure out something uh that maybe could speed the process along uh you, you know my view is your staff generally does you know outstanding work they do a lot of work behind the scenes that nobody really sees. And so, you know, we want to recognize and honor that. Um, but sometimes mistakes do get made. And when you can't correct out those mistakes quickly, I think that's going to lead to just growing frustration. Um, and, you know, that'll spill over in all sorts of ways that none of us want to see. Um, so um, those are my thoughts. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Dave. So um, anyone who joined via the link, please just raise your virtual hand. And if you join via the phone and would like to comment, um, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. There is no one joined by phone currently. All right. Well, why don't we give the why don't we give it just a few a bit longer here? All right, I'll close the public comment window. Um, thank you, everyone who joined. And again, I really, truly appreciate everyone who joins these meetings and gave us comments, feedback, you know, support, advice, counsel um, throughout this process. 2022 is a big year for Vermont. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can just continue to improve the program in 2023. Any uh, concluding thoughts, um, Julie or Kyle? Um, I would echo all of that. It's been a long but productive year. There's dozens of holidays that folks out there are celebrating right now. So whatever you're celebrating, I hope it brings you joy. I don't have much to add after you know both your statement and, and your statement, Pepper. 2022 has gone by very uh, quickly, at least from my corner of the world. I think time's an interesting thing these days, but so much has been accomplished in 2022 and look forward to seeing everybody in 2023. Thanks for joining.